Welcome to Conversations with Kay. I'm Kay Ryder. And every week I talk with Vermonters who are leaders in the fields of government, healthcare, education, the arts, and community life. My guest is Scott Finn, and Scott is the new president and CEO of Vermont Public Radio. And welcome to our radio listeners, WBVTLP 99.3 FM. Welcome, Scott. Thank you, Kay. I'm so excited to be here. Welcome to Conversations to Kay, and welcome to Vermont. I appreciate it. This is such a beautiful, spectacular state. Oh, wait till, wait, wait till the fall colors come. <laughs> then you're really going to love it. Um, VPR did a national search to find you. Uh, why did you want to come to Vermont Public Radio? You know, uh, Vermont Public Radio has a national reputation. People who run stations uh, that are, let's say, of a medium or smaller size, look to VPR as a model of how you do things, both in terms of the content creation, the news, the music, but also fundraising and community engagement. And so when that came open, I knew that if I had a chance, I had to try. Um, and here I am. I feel very lucky to have this job. I tell people this is really the best job in public media. Mm, yeah. Well, you know, uh, member support is amazing in Vermont. And the number of people in Vermont, when you consider the population, the number of people who listen to VPR. I have some numbers on that, actually. We have more than uh, 227,000 listeners out of a state. I mean, we do also have some surrounding states, but out of a state this size, that's amazing. Oh, yeah. We have 28,000 members. Per capita, that's one of the highest rates of membership in the entire country. Vermonters really support public media. Right. Um, you were in West Virginia before you came here. That's right. Tell us about that. I, I ran, well, first of all, I started out as a Vista worker in West Virginia. Um, they sent me to a place called Big Ugly Creek, <laughs> which is actually a small, beautiful little place. Um, and it was my job to turn the, the, the old elementary school, which had been abandoned, into a community center. And it was, uh, I had no idea what I was doing. I was 22, I was fresh out of college. And I went to this community center and just kind of hung out there, unable to do anything. And the kids would get off the bus and, you know, just out of boredom, I would like play games with them. And th the next day after I met the kids, the moms come down out of the hollers and they're like, who is this strange man that is playing with our children? <laughs> I introduce myself, I tell my tale of woe. And then the women of the community all came together and they got buckets, they got water out of the creek. Um, they, someone had a friend that had a dumpster company. Someone else had uh, experience with plumbing. And they all came together and I didn't do anything. They really did all the work. Uh, and we saved that community center. Anyway, that was my introduction to West, to West Virginia and the rural life there. Um, I went on to become a journalist for the award-winning newspaper, the Charleston Gazette. Uh, that was a great life. And then I was lucky enough to go into public media in West Virginia. Uh, West Virginia Public Broadcasting, which in West Virginia it's both the NPR station and the PBS station ah, together. Ah, ah, well, um, VPR has both news and class classical stations. Uh, do you like that combination? I like it a lot. And the reason I like it is because people can have a choice. In West Virginia, we're still what they call a mixed format station, which was classical in the middle of the day and news you know, at other times. You might remember that at VPR. Right. But people like my predecessors, Mark Vogelsang and Robin Turno, she, they were, they were um, brave enough and clever enough to build out two separate but equal networks, one classical and one news. And I tell you more and more when people get tired of all the craziness that's going on in our news anymore, <laughs> I find myself turning over the classical and having this wonderful sort of respite. Now, VPR is a very, well, I agree with you. I mean, I, I'm doing a lot of reading and listening to music myself. Uh, I, I catch the headlines in the morning, but, you know, other than that, I don't dwell on it all day. I think, I think a lot of people can't, so there you go. Um, VPR is a very strong organization right now. They, they've had uh, great success. Uh, but there are some challenges uh, looking in the, into the future, and, and one of these involves the great growth in what we call digital media. Mm -hmm. Would you talk to our audience about that? Well, it's how people are accessing you in new ways. And so it used to be all we had to worry about was one thing, which is creating a live radio program or set of them and broadcasting them over towers. We still do all of that, but now more and more, 
that live broadcast has to be delivered over things like your smartphone or your computer or these new speakers from Google and Alexa. Um, and so there's that. In addition, people like my daughter who's 15, they like to listen to podcasts, which are just basically shows available on demand on your schedule. And so we do that as well. And so the challenge is, but it's the opportunity, is to deliver um, great audio storytelling in the old ways that we need and also the new ways that people expect. Yeah, and the young folks, uh, they, they're, they're different, aren't they? I mean, they, they, they're used to just, you know, I don't like this, I'm going to turn it right off, you know. And, yeah. and you have one chance to grab them. That's right. You, and you, you know what? They have a world, it is a golden age of audio. Never before, not since maybe, I don't know, the 30s and 40s, have we had so much great scripted radio. There's great fiction podcasts out there you can listen to. And my daughter knows all about those. And she doesn't have to listen to public radio. But let me tell you a quick story. Sure. Um, we were driving home one day from school. And uh, we had this new podcast called Jolted that we've just produced. It's about this school shooting that almost happened in Fairhaven right. that and led the governor to change his mind about gun violence, right? And it's a wonderful five-part series, you should listen. We listened to the first episode. She didn't want to because, you know, it was like, oh, that's public radio, I don't want to hear that. We drove into the driveway, it wasn't done yet. I turn off the car and she says, Ted, we're not done yet. <laughs> Turn the car back on. We had a driveway moment together. Good. Uh, so I think that young people are not that different. They want great stories, but they're going to demand, you know, we have to be better than anything else she can listen to out there in the whole world. And there's a lot of music out there for her to listen to. The music and stories, it's, it's a great time to be a listener. <laughs> Speaking of stories, I love what you're doing. You're going out into the Vermont communities uh, tell me more. And, and these are stories, uh, people come where, wherever you are, mm -hmm. and they tell you about listening to Vermont Public Radio and what the, they like, and perhaps what you could do better for their community. Can you talk about those? Yeah, we've been to 10 different events across the state so far, um, all corners of the state from Island Pond to Bennington and everything in between. Um, and we just go with an open mind. We actually had these conversations, Kay, that are really wonderful. Um, the people come and then we have them pair up with other folks in the room. Sometimes they're VPR staff, sometimes they're people they don't even know from their own community. And they talk about these questions about how can VPR serve you better? Or what's the main issue that you're facing challenge as a community? Um, and we're hearing back some themes are emerging. And one of the themes is that people are concerned, well, first of all, people love their communities in Vermont. You know mm -hmm. this. Yep. And there's so much strength, but they're also concerned. There are trends going on where you know, low-income people are having more struggles. Uh, the divide between rich and poor is getting greater. The divide between urban areas and more rural areas. And I think VPR will be tackling that divide in 2019. We're working on a project, and so stay tuned for that. Great. Now, um, I'm talking with Scott Finn, and Scott is the new president and CEO of Vermont Public Radio. And this is where I first interview with Scott. Um, other, now, Chittenden County, hmm. other than Chittenden County, in the Burlington area, the state of Vermont is really, I'd call it pretty rural. I, and uh, do, um, how does, if you're scheduling for a rural area, uh, does this really affect the, the way you set up your program? You're, you, you, have to, you have a lot of listeners in Chittenden County, so how do you handle this? <laughs> well, one of the things is people still depend on, we've been talking about digital, but people still depend on that old-fashioned radio signal. And, you know, one thing that you know more about than I do, actually, is our response to Hurricane Irene. Um, but I hear stories about how when everything else failed, smartphones and everything, you could turn on your battery-powered radio to VPR and get information that you needed. I want to tell you about this because VPR actually held the state together. Mm -hmm. And I'm not exaggerating. I mean, I'm not exaggerating at all. This is a true story. And, uh, you know, all, the, all these rural communities where people had been flooded and uh, uh, people were, uh, you know, the house was, they, they couldn't get into their homes, one thing and another. And, uh, you know, VPR actually, Robin Turnow told me this story, that they were on air and, you know, 24 hours a day. And uh, 
the uh, a man called in from some strong, small community and said, I, I haven't seen Mr. So-and-so since the flood. Mm -hmm. If anybody has, please call VPR and let me know. Within, you know, decent amount of time, call came in. I saw Mr. So-and-so uh, walking along the road, you know, but this is great public service. You know, and you're going to think that, you know, of course I work for the place. I'm going to say nice things about it. <laughs> but I am constantly impressed with the quality of the employees at VPR. Um, we have the people that you see and hear all the time on the air are top-notch, national-level talent. And, and like Jane Lindholm, who's the host of Vermont Edition, or Mitch Wortlieb, who is our Morning Edition host. It's such great talent. But also behind the scenes, the people you don't see. Um, we have such a wonderful sounding station, and you might take it for granted, but actually there are a lot of stations in this country where what, what happens locally at that station doesn't sound as good as the national programming at NPR. At our station it sounds at least as good and sometimes better, and that's because we have these really talented engineers that understand sound and how to deliver it to your ears. Um, so I've just inherited this wonderful thing, <laughs> and it's my job basically to keep it healthy and strong, and that's what we're trying to do. Right. Well, when they had a they had a big open house there, uh, in um, and and I went with my my husband and my daughter, and of course, I went into the tech area, <laughs> and, <laughs> and I, I had a, an opportunity to talk with one of the engineers, and he was thrilled at the quality just absolutely thrilled and he showed me everything that was there to look at. I mean, it was, it was great. Well, one of the things people might not think about, other media, and I used to work for a newspaper, and your product was the written word on a, on a print piece of paper and then on the internet. That in a lot of ways is a lot easier than doing what we do in broadcast, which is there are people here at VCAM behind the scenes um, and it takes a lot of extra effort to make sure that everybody can reach you know, these signals. Um, but just like you are here, Vermont Public Radio is a service. We have more than two dozen signals throughout the state. Uh, not all of them reach a whole lot of people. I dare say there are one or two that reach more cows than people. <laughs> but, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> which, but you know what? Th those people depend on this service in those communities even more than the folks in Burlington because they don't always have a lot of other choices. Right. I hear over and over again that you, I don't even have TV. I listen to VPR instead. Or I can't get good internet service here. I listen to VPR. We're very aware of that, and we're going to maintain that even as we try new things online. I would like to ask you a question. Uh, you went to Grand Isle County, correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. now, now, Grand Isle, of course, is very close to Burlington and yet very far away. That's it's exactly right. I mean, I did a little article about it, and that's exactly the wording I used. So oh, really? close yet that a world away. Yeah. Huh. Well, how? How? Oh, um, well. Uh, a lot of different ways. I mean, first of all, the pace of life is so much slower there in a lovely way. Mm -hmm. um, and, but they have, and they have a whole different set of challenges. I mean, the, f the number of farms there, especially dairy farms, I was hearing has gone way down. Fruit farms, yeah. yeah. And then also there are concerns about um, pollution on the lake, of course. And people in Burlington care a lot about that as well. Uh, but it's very, it makes when people talk about it affecting their property values, their ability to be able to make a living through tourism, then you know that, be that comes to life for me and I really understand what pollution means. And VPR has done a lot of coverage of uh, pollution in Lake Champlain. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's very, uh, I interview the Lake Champlain Committee every year, the head of the Lake Champlain Committee. And millions of dollars have been spent and the lake is holding its own. Mm -hmm. Now, can you imagine, Scott, if the money had not been spent? Well, exactly right. And if there's a difference between Vermont and West Virginia, well, there are a couple probably. <laughs> the politics are a little different. But one of the differences I see is that in Vermont, it, uh, there is this idea that c collective action, community action can make a difference, can tackle the problems. Um, and so yeah, I think VPR is part of that. We want to have one thing I'm hearing over and over again on the Tell Me More tour is that people don't just want to hear about the problem. They want to hear an in-depth conversation about possible solutions. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're going to try to do that. That's good. That's good. Yes, and there are some things that have not been tried yet. And uh, 
you know, it, uh, there are, uh, one thing, of course, is that the, the lake is very affected by what com co comes through the canal from Albany. Mm. That's, that's a big source of problems. It's New and, York's fault. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> we like to say that sometimes, but in that case, I think, I think probably it's true. Um, you have a good board of directors at VPR, don't you? Be very strong. Yeah, um, a woman named Peggy Williams, who a lot of people might know from her time leading uh, St. Mike's. Um, she was the board chair until just very recently, until um, this month actually. She was my first board chair and she was so good. As anyone knows Peggy, she just laid it out. She's like, Scott, here's what you have to do, A, B, C, D, and it was so helpful. Now, uh, my new board chair is Charlie Brown, who is the former director of the Fairbanks Museum. Um, and also a really wonderful guy and just so supportive. Um, and we have folks of all different backgrounds from all over the state on the VPR board. Well, that's great. Now, um, the last uh, capital funds drive, uh, which Robin uh, was the honcho for, mm -hmm. they, they raised $10 million. But, and, and part of this went to do uh, renovations at the studio and expansion of the studio. But part of it is what uh, you, could, you could call it, it's an innovative fund. It's yes. an initiatives fund, if you will. And that's a place where you have some money where you can take a chance. Yeah, it was such a wonderful gift <laughs> that the donors <laughs> to the VPR Next campaign gave us. Because the Innovation Fund has actually, it's founded some of the most exciting and popular things we're doing right now. Um, Brave Little State is the name of a program that we have. You hear it some on the air, and it's also a podcast. And the, the idea behind Brave Little State, do you know where that quote comes from, by the way? Um, President Coolidge. Ah, oh yes, Calvin, yes. Yeah, he yeah. said after, uh, after speaking of Irene, after flooding, he said, uh, there's a quote about, you know, Vermont is such a brave little state. And so we thought that's perfect. And we, we picked it up, made it our uh, program name. People ask questions and we answer them. That's brave little state. Vermonters actually vote on which questions they want us to answer. And so one of my favorites was, there are all these interesting um, road names in Vermont. Uh, and why is that, why is that? And you see them all over the place repeated over and over again. One name is Lime Kiln Road, mm -hmm. right? And why is that? And so our reporters went out and found a lime kiln that used to be in, in your area of the, of the woods. I think it's Charlotte. Charlotte. Right. And, um, and then Poor Farm Road uh -huh. was another one. Why there's so much? They had poor farms, and they interviewed an expert in poor farms who explained that they were actually not so lovely places to be, um, and that still to this day there's a stigma associated with having a family member that was in the poor farm. Oh yeah. I learned so much from that one question, why is it called Poor Farm Road? Uh -huh. I love Brave Little State, and that's supported by the Innovation yeah. Fund. Calvin C Coolidge was quite a taciturn man, but he was actually he actually known for eloquence when he talked about Vermont. Hmm. He loved he loved the state of Vermont. Well, now that you're living here, you'll have to go to he, the uh, farm down there where he, he was farm. He was uh, uh, no, it wasn't a farm actually, but he was he was sworn in as the president in this teeny tiny little place in Plymouth, and his father swore him in, and and he uh, and uh, Calvin Coolidge and his wife Grace are buried there very simply. It's just, just a, it's a very uh, beautiful, very beautiful Vermont site. Can I ask you a question, Kay? Sure. Uh, how is such a, a place that's relatively small in population have such an outsized role in the nation's political like life? You have Howard Dean and Bernie Sanders, so many different people, Patrick Leahy. Yeah. I mean, what, what do you think is the cause of that? Well, one thing is that we keep reelecting people. And the more you're in the Senate, the longer you're in the Senate, the more power you have. Senator Leahy has a great deal of, great deal of power now. And uh, if the Democrats uh, get a hold of the House or the Senate, you know, and get, get a hold of the Senate, he'll have even more. But, you know, the one thing is they, they stay there a long time. Once we elect someone, we tend to, to, tend to keep them there. Hmm. And that's, that's one reason. But I think that, uh, I think that the pe people who become leaders in Vermont, I think Bernie would be the exception, but I think the people who become leaders in Vermont sort of many times have embodied the spirit, if you will, the brave little state. <laughs> yeah. Some of the senators, uh, Senator Stafford, Senator Leahy, people have lived here all their lives, and uh, Howard Dean didn't, but he, he, 
Howard was a great politician, and he, he uh, mixed with the people, if you will. So I think that's, I think that's one thing, too. I think that's, I think that's part of it. And they're, they're, they're smart enough to listen. Yeah. I think that's another thing. The one thing that West Virginia and Vermont really do have in common, it's about that personal relationship between people. That's so important here, face-to-face -face relationships. And that's why VPR is doing the Tell Me More tour, and we're really trying to do more live community events throughout next year, too, because the relationship here is, is about face-to-face. -face. Yeah. If you were driving along a road in Vermont, and these are four, name, four names people could yell out, and you'd know exactly. Pat, Madeline, Bernie, and Howard. <laughs> Yeah, Madeline Kunin actually is doing a live um, taping on Vermont Edition. It's going to be an event, and it's going to be on the radio as well, talking about her new book. Right. Uh, September 26th, I think. Well, well, Madeline's a friend of mine, so I'm glad she's going to be on. I, uh, uh, she, she's, she, she was a good leader, I think. I look forward to meeting her. Oh, well, you'll like her. I'm sure you will. I'm <laughs> sure you will, Scott. I'm talking with uh, Scott Finn, who is the new, new president and CEO of the Vermont Public Radio. Um, the, the board actually has created what's called a strategic plan. Uh, strategic plans can be interesting. They can uh, mean something or they can mean absolutely nothing. Uh, <laughs> but if they're revisited, you can tell if you're going the direction that you wanted to go. Um, one thing, of course, is financial stability for the station. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to ask you this, maybe on ferry, you haven't been here very long, but <laughs> <laughs> how much fundraising can you do on air before you annoy people? Well, you know, it's, it's a conundrum because no one really wants to hear a lot of fundraising on the air. And yet, when we don't do it, uh, we, we, you know, and, and that on-air fundraising is, is less and less important to our budget because right now about half of our members are what are called sustaining members. And anyone who listens to VPR probably knows a sustaining member is someone who gives monthly and uh, doesn't have to give during the fund drive. But we still find that membership drives are the best way to get new people on board. So they still have an important role to play. We are doing an experiment um, right now as we speak, as this is taping, where we have reduced greatly the amount of pitching, about in half over what we usually do in a pledge drive. And we're trying to see whether we can raise as much money and receive those new members without being on the air quite so much and interrupting programming. Let's hope it works. Yeah, all right. Well, good luck. Good luck. Because <laughs> I hate to hear fundraising on the air. I mean, it's just one of those things. I've listened to fundraising on VPR for many years now, so I guess that's probably part of it, too. Well, let me say, though, I, I, so my background is I used to be a reporter. I reported for a newspaper called the Charleston Gazette. It's a wonderful community-owned um, newspaper. Two things happened last year to the Charleston Gazette. One, it won the Pulitzer Prize for its opioid coverage, and two, it went bankrupt. Uh, it doesn't matter if you do wonderful journalism unless you get support. And it's not a, it's not a, a, I don't think it's, I think it's interesting that many other media are now starting to copy the public media model of a combination of support. We get support from our members, from our underwriters, um, and we, you know, we get grants, we get major gifts. All those things come together to be a diverse funding source. And I think that's, at the end of the day, it might be a little bit of annoying, but I'd rather work for our membership that way than to work for some other media uh, funding sources. I think mm -hmm. it's the best way to fund media. Yeah, yeah. Membership is terrifically important. It's like buying a subscription for a concert series. That's, uh, it's that's a community true. institution, like right. the symphony, like the library. Right. You know, especially nowadays when there's you know, challenges about fake news. Mm. <laughs> and, oh, well, let's talk that. about that. Let's okay. talk about that. Now, do you, uh, there, there's a lot of stuff going on out there that we know is not true. And uh, the, so certain newspapers, radio stations are saying we're going to tell the truth. Should VPR tell the truth? Oh, yes. And VPR, I think our role in this time when people are trying to challenge the truth or whether the truth even matters is not to get worked up about it, not to get emotional, but be very determined to call people on it over and over again. Um, and be really willing to challenge folks. And I think Jane Lindholm, for example, on Vermont Edition, does this really well. She's polite, uh, she's businesslike and professional, but she will not allow people 
to uh, get away with saying something that's not true. Yeah. Well, that's extremely important. And there are polite ways to deal with this broken record. You just keep asking, you know, the same, same thing a different way, perhaps, but you want an answer. Well, and, and NPR, for example, they're actually changing their interview techniques a little bit because um, they're allowing, for example, for longer interviews and they're doing fewer live interviews. They're doing them pre-taped because they realized that people were manipulating the live interviews and trying to get away with not answering questions. Oh, yeah. So we're not perfect. We have a long <laughs> way to go, but we are trying to you know, deal with the ways that people are intentionally trying to manipulate and mislead people, and we're trying to respond. Oh, sure. Well, you know, it's not just uh, manipulative things. It's, um, you know, should you cover both sides of a controversial issue? Yeah, all sides. Ah, because right? when you get into that, you do get into the manipulators. Oh, that's true. There's this theory that, I don't know if your uh, viewers and listeners know about, called the Overton window. Uh, it's like, what's the acceptable boundaries of a debate? Um, and so it's always, they, you, you might say, well, why don't you cover both sides of an issue? But some people say that there are certain issues where there really isn't an, another side. And so there's a debate about the terms of the debate. Right. Right? Um, we don't have an issue around, well, and on our station, we don't say that there's two sides of a white supremacy issue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> those, those are unscientific and you know, rejected ideas that we don't debate both sides of it. Right, um, right. And, and, but there are other issues that there really is a legitimate, gun violence is a great example. There are legitimate differences in how to deal with that. And we, we believe that we should try to get all those perspectives. We have very little time left. Do you, do you have, a personal goal for the station, for, for BPR? Yeah, I think my personal goal is to make sure that we explore the whole Vermont story together. And, you know, it's really easy to get caught up in your personal bubbles. <laughs> um, and like through the Tell Me More tour, we're trying really hard to make sure that we're telling the stories of the Nepali community here in Burlington, or the folks that I met in Island Pond, people who aren't listeners even, mm -hmm. um, and make sure we're reaching out to everybody. That's my personal goal. Well, Scott, I wish you great success at VPR, and I love the station. I mean, I, uh, I'm thankful to have, to have classical mu music to turn into when, when the news gets to me sometimes, you know. <laughs> so I wish you great success. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Kay. Thanks for joining us on Conversations with Kay.